This meeting is being recorded. Welcome everyone to our webinar. I'll just give it a minute, wait for everyone to join the Zoom and then we'll get started on our content for today. And I'll just introduce my colleague Hayley, who's going to be on the webinar today as well. She'll be helping us out to moderate the chat and the Q&A too. Um, before we get started into our content today, I'll just run through a few little housekeeping points. So please use the chat for any general comments you have throughout the webinar. Hayley will be in there um, chatting to you all as well. And then if you do have any specific questions about the content we go through today, please pop that in the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. That way, when we get to the end of the webinar, we'll be able to see all of the questions um, that need answering as well. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop those in the Q&A and we'll get to them live at the end. I'll just share my screen. Bear with me one second and then we'll get started. Rach, you're muted. All right, is that better for everyone? You can hear me again? Perfect. Great, thank you. All righty, so a reminder that Superhero does not provide financial advice. It considers your personal objectives, financial situation, or particular needs, and all investments carry risk, so please consider carefully before investing. Past performance is not indicative of future performance and any graphs, charts, pictures or graphics provided today are for illustrative purposes only. And a reminder that this webinar is the last one for the year actually in our Sector Spotlight series where we've gone through a range of different um, yeah, sectors that are in the market and that's according to the Global Industry Classification Standard or the GICS system. Um, so today we're looking at the information technology sector. Um, now, we know technology touches everything that we do, but we are focusing on companies that are actually in um, that techno technology classification today. So what is the information technology sector? Um, and I've just realized here, I've actually got the, <laughs> the wrong text on this slide. Um, so ignore the text on the left. Um, but when it comes to the right over there, what you can see is called the information technology index or the XIJ index. And that's the companies in the ASX 200 that are in the information technology sector. And here it is. So what are the companies that make up that sector? It going from top to bottom in terms of market cap in Australia, you can see on the right there, we've got companies like Wise Tech Global, Computer Share, Xero, which we'll go through in detail a little bit later today, those big three. And then further down, you might see some companies that you know, like Block is in there, um, look, a lot of these you might not know as a consumer, um, but they are technology companies that are often selling to other businesses. Um, so you, if you're working in a business, you might know of these. Um, a little bit more. So um, a lot of them are also focused on particular industries, whether that be as well. So we'll go through a few today just to help you understand what is actually behind how these companies make money, um, because a lot of them aren't, you know, brands you might see on an ad, for example, when it comes to the tech sector in Australia. When it comes to the US, um, you might have heard of the NASDAQ 100, and the NASDAQ 100 is um, comprised of 100 of the largest and most innovative non-financial companies that are listed on the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ is one of the two main exchanges in the US market. Um, we have multiple exchanges here in Australia too, um, but the main one by far is kind of, or the biggest one is the ASX or the Australian Stock Exchange. Whereas in the US, there's kind of two main exchanges. The first one is the New York Stock Exchange and the second is the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ is where a lot of the tech companies are listed. So you can see there, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, a lot of these companies that um, we recognize as consumers. Alphabet, you've got there, which is the parent company of Google. Um, and Tesla, which, you know, Tesla, 
some might think it, it doesn't sit in the, in the tech sector company as well. So we'll be going through some of those, those big companies today as well. Some of those on the NASDAQ 100 aren't companies. So just to clarify that, you can see things like PepsiCo and um, Costco there. But generally, the NASDAQ is where a lot of tech companies in the US are listed. All right. So how, how does tech perform? Um, and again, the NASDAQ 100 um, isn't totally representative of technology, the sector, um, but it is kind of where people often look to when it comes to US tech. And you can see here a comparison of the performance of the NASDAQ 100 over time. Versus, oh, sorry, guys, that I'm cutting out. I'll try and speak a little bit slower just to make sure that you're hearing me okay. We'll see how we go. Um, I may need to turn my video off if it gets too bad. All right, I'm just going to turn my video off for a little bit and see if that's any better. Sorry, guys. All right, hopefully that's a little bit better for you now. Um, but what we can see here is the NASDAQ 100 compared to the S&P 500, which is the 500 biggest companies on, in the US market. And the NASDAQ really has outperformed um, in the past couple of years. You can see there, especially since 2020. So kind of started to really take off in the, in the 2010s, mid 2020s, 2010s. And then after 2020, we saw the entire market crash. Then after that, 2020 and 2021 really saw the tech sector take off. And if we think about what was going on at the time, um, a lot of traditional retail shop shutting down, um, people really needing to move online for, for living a lot of their lives. We saw the tech sector really kind of boom during that period. Um, everything from companies like Zoom, which we're on today, um, to, you know, things like e-commerce companies. And in 2022, we have seen a bit of a drop off, not only in the NASDAQ, um, but also in the broader market. Just to confirm, can people still see my screen share? Is that, if someone, yep, okay, great, thank you. I think someone was just struggling there. Yeah, so we have seen a drop off and that drop off has happened more in technology than it has in the broader market, which you can see on that graph there. Um, but kind of technology is still sitting um, above the S&P 500 when it comes to all kind of that, that historical return in the past couple of years. Um, so just an interesting one there and I guess there was all of this growth that came to technology in 2020, 2021. Um, and as you know, a lot of lockdowns have opened up across the world, people have somewhat returned to their normal habits. So people are out at restaurants again, they're you know, shopping at retail stores. Some technology really has been embedded. I know, you know here at Superhero, we still use Zoom every day, um, but I guess those growth rates haven't continued maybe at the same rate that, that people initially saw or expected. And when it comes to the tech industry around the world, this graph here just compares the size of the biggest tech companies in the world. So you can see that Apple is by far the biggest, um, followed by Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Nvidia. And then you can see Meta there as well, um, kind of topping it out. So Apple by far is the, the largest company in the world. Um, and they're one of the ones that we'll go through a little bit further on. Apple. Um, just an, an interesting stat here, Apple is bigger than the entire Australian stock exchange as one company. So that gives you an idea of just the, the sheer size of that company. And when it comes to what we've seen in tech returns, which you saw kind of as an overall graph there, this graph just shows, and it's as of June, so not, not quite fully up to date, but it just gives you an idea of kind of the decrease in valuation of some of these companies as, as a result of the drop off. Um, so you can see each one of these companies has had a bit of, bit of a drop off in their total market valuation as a result of the share prices having decreased um, quite a bit, particularly in the tech sector this year. All right, now moving on to a few trends before we jump into, into some company specifics. Um, these trends are actually pulled out from a Deloitte report. Deloitte are one of the big kind of four accounting firms, but also provide a lot of industry insights and research. So I thought I'd just take you through some of the trends that they're seeing for 2023. Um, it's quite interesting, not only to look obviously at the companies themselves, but also the bigger market trends that, that are affecting these companies as well. 
So the first one here is data sharing made easy. Um, what does that mean? So new technologies that promise to simplify the mechanics of data sharing across and between organizations while preserving the veil of privacy. Now, we here at Australia are very, very um, aware of privacy concerns at the moment. Some of our biggest companies um, that do hold a lot of data, personal data that is, have been you know, breached or subject to cyber attacks. So it's never been more important um, to protect data, um, but obviously data is a, a huge um, you know, benefit to companies in making better decisions, not only within a company, but between companies as well. So how can we allow for that data to be shared in a private way is definitely a trend that, that Deloitte's saying. Um, and you can see there an example. So during COVID, um, by pooling clinical data on shared platforms in the early days of COVID, researchers, medical authorities, and drug makers were able to accelerate the development of treatments and vaccines. So we, when we think about sharing data around the world, um, different countries with different approaches and stats were able to share data, which then led to better treatments and better outcomes for people. Um, and that's kind of a great benefit of data sharing, but obviously um, there's a lot of risk that comes with that as well. The second one is the cloud going vertical. Um, so I'll, I'll just read out here on the slide, but the center of gravity around digital transformation has shifted from meeting the IT needs of an industry agnostic organization to meeting the unique strategic and operational needs of each sector and subsector. So what does this mean? It means that uh, I guess in the past, you had these big tech companies providing services that were kind of a, in the box solution. So a company would need um, a cloud platform or a hosting platform for some of their technology. Um, and a provider would say, here you go, this is the product we provide. Now what we're seeing is providers going into very sector specific um, technology. So they're building hospitality industry or they're building specifically fighters and, and kind of a consumer product builders is getting closer to make sure that uh, the best the best outcome is is achieved in the end for the consumer um, by you know getting that that tech stack really really specific and ready to use the third one here is blockchain ready for business now blockchain and distributed ledger technology is fundamentally changing the nature of doing doing business across organizational boundaries and helping sorry companies reimagine how they make and manage identity, brand, governance, or sorry, professional certifications, copyrights, and other tangible and digital assets. So we've all heard of Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, but what we're talking about here is companies really starting to use the ledger technology um, that blockchain is all about um, for business use cases that already exist. So using blockchain to transform their current processes, make them more efficient, more secure, um, less so, I guess, using Bitcoin to buy things, but more using the technology behind blockchain um, to improve their business. The last three here, cyber AI, so real defense. We spoke about privacy a little bit initially, um, but essentially using artificial intelligence or AI to provide that security is another trend that we're seeing. I won't go into this in detail, um, but all of the slides will be in the recording as well. Um, but essentially, yeah, using machine learning um, to detect attacks better, to help with prevention as well, and then to, you know, treat those attacks when they happen. Um, the next one here is the tech stack goes physical. Um, I, I actually bought um, my first smartwatch on Friday, and I'm already seeing the benefits of the tech stack going physical. But a big trend that we're seeing is smart devices. So not only things like smartwatches that we wear, but if we think about We've got a security camera on the icon there. Um, really technology influencing things that we see in the physical world and that connection between sharing of information between the physical world and the digital world um, is another trend that we're seeing. And when you think about industry uses for this, um, the medical industry, for example, is a huge um, beneficiary of this for better diagnostics, better prevention, treatment, um, and that feedback between a physical device that's measuring something and then feeding that back into systems that can, um, can report on that and analyze that data as well. And the last one here is automating at scale. 
So businesses are continuously trying to identify repetitive manual processes and applying a combination of engineering, automation and self-service. So how can we get more efficient? How can we automate more of our manual processes and get back to doing business that actually adds value to our end consumers and therefore, you know, adding revenue and, and reducing costs for the business at the end of the day. All right, so on to our stock specifics. So we'll go through here a couple of Aussie companies and then we'll go through a couple of US companies as well. And as you have questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A function too. Alrighty, so WiseTech, what does WiseTech do? They provide cloud-based software solutions to the logistics industry worldwide. Um, so they are listed in Australia and Australian based, but they have business and customers all around the world. So the company develops, sells and implements software solutions that enable logistics service providers to facilitate the movement and storage of goods and information. Now we know that you know, products are more and more being shipped globally around the world and WiseTech is a company that allows this to happen um, in a digital and automated way. So they are the biggest company in the information technology sector on the ASX um, at $18.8 billion. Um, they've got a very, very small dividend yield in the last 12 months. Um, and you can see there in the last one year, their stock price hasn't really moved much. But in the last five years, they've seen growth of 379.82%, um, which, you know, even for a one year is, you know, quite, quite strong performance. Um, and you can see the graph, the graph there, a little bit of ups and downs in the last five years, but the five year trend has been quite strong for WiseTech. And what are they actually doing to grow? Now, note on all of the information I'm going to go through today. The first slide that I'll chat about for each stock is some information that you can find in your superhero app if you go and search for it on right now. This is from the companies. Actually, find this if you search a stock on your superhero app and you scroll down a little bit and hit the news tab, you'll be able to see any of the ASX announcements that a company makes. And this includes their results presentations and their annual reports, which you can then go in and have a little bit of a look, not only at some more financial data, but also some information about what the company is actually doing to try and grow. Um, so you can find out a lot about the company management as well, what they're doing in the ESG and, and kind of ethics space too. They'll often report on all of that in more detail. So, I mean, you can see here, revenue is increasing, their EBITDA and their net profit are also increasing over time, which is great to see. Um, important to look not only at how much the company is making in terms of revenue, but how are they managing that cost ratio as well to make sure that the company is actually profitable. Um, and you can see that they're focusing on development of their cargo wise product, as an example, one of their main products. So what are they doing? They're looking at I think it's landside logistics, warehousing, they've got shipping elements to it, digital documents, customs and compliance and international e-commerce. So really focusing on enhancing their product for their customers as well. Alrighty, moving on to computer share. Computer share, still tech, completely different industry. So um, CPUs, the stock code there, and their principal activity is the issuer services compromise <laughs> register. It's a bit confusing. I won't um, go through that, but essentially they do investment administration. So they actually work with a lot of the other listed companies on the stock exchange um, and help them with things like corporate actions. Um, so think about um, a new stock issue or something like that. Um, stakeholder relationship management, corporate governance and related services. So they essentially help other listed companies um, to manage uh, being a listed company if that makes sense. Um, so similar market cap to WiseTech, they're at $16 billion. Um, they've got a dividend yield in the last 12 months of 2.28%, a PE ratio of 50.26. And in the last one year, they've actually seen really strong growth. So their five year, um, you know, still on a one year basis is still hitting that over 10%. But a lot of that growth has actually come in the last one year, um, which is just quite interesting there to see they really take it off and a bit of an outlook for them this is from one of their reports 
Um, what are they looking for in FY23, which started, started in July? So they expect earnings per share to be up around 90%, um, which is quite a strong number. Um, they've got here some key assumptions. So they're assuming a couple of things that are going to happen in order for them to reach their goals for the next things that might stop them reaching their new goals. Government services businesses. So they're looking at their different business units as well and um, where they're thinking they'll see growth, but also the risks there too. All right, Zero. Now, Zero operates as a software company worldwide. So the company essentially is a cloud based accounting software that connects small business to their advisors. So a lot of small businesses use Zero. Um, their main competitor you might know as well, MYOB. Um, I believe MYOB are based in New Zealand or, you know, came from New Zealand and Zero's, I guess, the Aussie, the Aussie competitor there. Um, Zero's got a market cap of 10 billion, so a little bit smaller than the other two. Um, and look, they're very much seen as a typical growth stock in the sense that they actually aren't making a profit yet. Um, but they have, I guess, seen quite significant growth in the past five years. Not so much in the last one year. They've really uh, felt the impact of kind of the tech sell-off that happened in 2022. Um, but in the last five years, they've still seen really strong growth, about 20% each year or just over that. So despite, you can see there on the graph, the big up and big down um, in the past one year, over the last five years have still seen kind of that strong growth, which when we're talking about investing and investing for the long term, um, you can really see there the difference between if you'd invested kind of just at the top versus if you really invested over the long term in a company, for example, if you had really strong conviction in, in zero, um, investing over the long term there, you would have been better off <laughs> for you. And what is zero looking like in terms of its growth? So you can see on the left um, some information about their, their revenue. So or it might be their lifetime value, actually. Um, let me double check. Yeah, might might be revenue here. So, well, essentially just shows you where they're getting their growth from. So really, Zero are starting to grow significantly in the international space. So their Australian New Zealand market is still growing. You can see there in the green, it's really growing, but international is where they're seeing most of their growth. Um, so a focus there on growing internationally. And if you see over on the on the map. Um, it's really America that they're focusing on. So really focusing on growing in the American space. Um, and you can see their 39% um, lifetime three-year growth for international. They've got an average subscriber lifetime of 9.2 years as well, which is an interesting point because when you compare it to maybe an e-commerce company where someone might buy something and then not, not again for six months, um, Zero really have this power when it comes to everything from pricing um, to really locking their customers in and providing uh, new product upsells really, um, because they do have that average subscriber count of 9.2 years and zero becomes a really embedded part of a business's um, accounting and processes once it is uh, introduced into the business. So they have kind of that really, really sticky product, if you like, um, as, a, as a software provider for small business. Alrighty. Moving on to the US market. Um, first up, we have Apple. So I don't really need to describe what Apple does, but essentially their main product is, um, is mobile phones. Sorry guys, I'll just pause for a moment and double check. How is my audio going? Is it all right? If someone doesn't mind, okay now. All right, really sorry about that guys. Just some, some Wi-Fi issues, okay. Appreciate it. Great. So Apple, obviously we know the iPhone, we know the iPad, we've got Apple Watches, we've all got AirPods. Um, essentially what Apple have done is created the <laughs> most beautiful and best tech ecosystem um, potentially ever to be in existence. They really, um, and that's personal opinion, by the way, not an investment note, but 
they've really created an entire ecosystem of products that work seamlessly together um, and created very much a community um, and an aspiration around their product as well, which, I mean, they're not surprising that they are the most valuable company in the world at $2.4 trillion. Um, and look, they've seen really consistent growth in the past five years. Over the past one year, they haven't. So they've been pretty stable at minus 1.43%. Um, but when you compare that to some of the drop-offs from other tech companies, um, really not too bad at, at just minus 1.3% there. In the last five years, um, pretty insane for a company that is pretty old now when it comes to the tech world. Um, I don't know the exact date that Apple started, but have been around, you know, since the 1900s, the late 1900s, and they're still seeing in the past five years, 245% um, growth. Um, so year on year, I mean, sitting at kind of just less than 50% there, which is pretty insane, I think. Um, and here's just, Apple don't do so much presentation, um, but they do have kind of their, their financials that are published on their Investor Center website. And you can see there, if you, so the most recent one being on the left, that they're still really, really growing in terms of um, their sales. So September 2022 versus September 2021, they went up um, from 65 to 70. Um, and I think it's, yeah, $70 million in terms of revenue from, from products. So still really growing. Their costs obviously grow with that as well. Um, but they've continued to see growth in their sales. Um, and I guess when you think about their strategy around the iPhone, for example, bringing out an iPhone every single year, I know I'm <laughs> a culprit of this, um, kind of that, that pull to go and buy the next iPhone every year um, is definitely one that we all, <laughs> we're all culprits of. And yes, they have, thank you, Robbie's made a note there about VR headsets, which is interesting as we go into meta as well, really that shift, not so much shift towards, um, but that focus more so um, than ever before on the VR world or this, um, this metaverse. Uh, so Apple's kind of starting to play in that space as well. Now, meta are uh, definitely the one that has, um, I guess, put a lot of money behind the metaverse, hence changing their name from Facebook to meta as well. Um, and Meta Platforms develops products that enable people to connect and share with friends fa and family through mobile devices, personal computers, virtual reality headsets, wearables, and in-home devices worldwide. So that's kind of what Meta sees itself as. Um, and you can see their virtual reality being kind of a core part of what they, they want to provide for people. Meta is quite a bit smaller than Apple, so $300 billion dollars. Um, and look, over the past <laughs> one and five years, it hasn't been great for Meta in terms of its share price. Um, there's been, I guess, a number of reasons for why that is, and I'll let you do your own research there. But an area they do, um, I guess, have a big bet on is this metaverse. So they're putting a lot of investment behind the metaverse and building out whatever that, <laughs> whatever, whatever that is to look like. I guess time will tell as to you know, exactly what products and services they're going to bring out. Um, but they've been, yeah, really moving in that space when it comes to VR and the metaverse. And this, you know, this graph really shows where Meta's at in terms of its revenue at the moment. So when we think there's Meta the business today and then there's an investment in what they think will become the future. Meta today makes, forget the exact number, but let's call it over 90%. Um, of their revenue from ads or a huge, huge, huge portion of their revenue comes from advertising. And that's both on Facebook and also on Instagram, um, which have a lot of linkages now. So if you're a business, it's pretty easy to set up an ad and for it to go across the entire Facebook and Instagram network. Um, and you can see here that they kind of hit a peak in Q4 2021 when it came to their advertising revenue. And 2022 has not been so strong. I mean, across the board, we've had some economic challenges for pretty much every sector. And what happens when there's challenges for businesses generally and the economy generally, companies start spending less on ads and that's Meta's main revenue source. So they're not like Apple where they're actually kind of 
in control of their own products and selling those. Um, they're actually reliant on other businesses buying ads on their platform. So if other companies aren't doing well, Meta therefore suffers as well when it comes to ad revenue. Um, we've also seen the rise of TikTok as an alternative platform. So if a brand, you know, had a million dollars to spend on ads during the year, maybe, you know, let's say 50% of that used to go to Meta. Now that 50% has to be split between Meta and TikTok for some brands as well. So there, there is competition headwinds there for them too. Um, and you can see pretty stable across all of the countries in terms of, um, I guess, what's growing and what's shrinking. Um, but the US and Canada, and um, I think it's Europe there specifically, have seen a little bit of a drop off, whereas um, kind of Asia Pacific and rest of the world have stayed pretty stable. And I guess that's probably because the places like China and, and Africa as well are really still growing when it comes to their digital adoption um, and social media as well. And the last one is Tesla. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk's, one of Elon Musk's babies. Um, so Tesla designs, develops, manufactures, leases and sells electric vehicles and energy generation and storage systems. Um, so the company operates in two segments, automotive and energy generation and storage. Um, so, you know, Tesla obviously is the brand on a car you see, but they also do a lot in the energy generation and storage space. Um, the market cap is sitting at $567 billion. Um, Tesla, you know, compared to some of these other companies is a super young company. Um, so, you know, huge valuation there. Um, and its PE ratio is sitting at 46.62 um, times. In the last one year has also seen a drop off with the, with the tech drop off. So at minus 50.36%, um, but in the last five years has seen growth of 756%, um, which is over 100% a year over the last five years. So you can see on the right there, really, really took off and just um, saw massive growth. And then in the past year, it has tapered off a little bit. Um, there's also, I think we'll go through in a minute, some ETFs that have exposure to some of these companies as well. And you'll see more of the, I guess, the market performance as opposed to each individual company. And here's just some Tesla numbers for you. So looking at their production, if we compare, if we look at, I don't know whether you can see there, Q3 2021, if we look at total production, you've got 237,823 vehicles. Compare that to this year, we've got 365,923 vehicles. So their production was up 54% year on year. Um, so that's from 2021 to 2022. Um, so still very much seeing strong growth in terms of their production. Um, they're opening new factories in the US. Their reports are super interesting about where they're choosing to do those as well. Um, so still growing quite a lot. Won't go through the rest of the details. Um, but yeah, still a company that's very much at the beginning of its journey um, in terms of production. Um, I'm starting to see more and more Teslas driving around in my neighborhood, that's for sure. Alrighty, now quickly to look at two ETFs. Um, the first one is the BetaShares NASDAQ 100 ETF. Um, so we spoke about the NASDAQ 100 before, but this ETF essentially tracks the performance of that index. Um, and you can see on the right there, the companies that were in the NASDAQ 100, we've got Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and the weighting on the right reflects essentially their market cap or the percentage of that index that they make up. So obviously Apple's the biggest company, um, on the NASDAQ 100. So instead of kind of giving 1% to every company on the NASDAQ, this ETF actually holds 13% of its total as Apple because Apple does make a, up a bigger proportion of the NASDAQ 100 from a valuation perspective. Um, so that's how this ETF is made up. So you'll get, I guess, more of the performance determined by Apple's performance versus you can see their Costco at 2.1%. Um, so important to understand how the makeup of the ETF actually reflect, reflects performance as well. You can see there on the left some of the stats. So this ETF does have a dividend yield. Obviously, will change on the year depending on how the companies themselves perform. Um, but in the last 12 months was at 3.3%. Um, and its performance in the last one year, minus 25%, um, which kind of reflects the market. 
but in the past five years sitting at 86.6%, um, so more than 10% a year there over the last five years. And the last ETF for today is the BetaShares Asia Technology Tigers ETF. We haven't focused on Asia in terms of specific stocks today, but the Asia Tech Tigers ETF tracks the performance of the 50 largest technology and online retail stocks in Asia, excluding Japan. Um, so it includes technology giants such as Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu and JD.com. Um, you may have heard of some of those, you may not have heard of others, um, but the Asian market is absolutely huge. Um, China's got kind of that growing middle class as well that are having, you know, that have more funds than ever before um, to spend, whether that be on online retail and they're more, they're more connected than ever before in terms of tech as well. Um, so look, its performance in the last one year has been minus 35%. And then the last five years, 7.31%. Now there was a time, it was around the 2020, start of 2021 mark, that this ETF was performing really, really well. It's not so much reflected in these numbers, but where we saw it kind of take a little bit of a downturn was when China really started cracking down, not only um, on COVID, but also on some of the technology companies as well. So um, I guess China is a country where the government does have quite a lot of control over business. And we saw them really starting to crack down on some of the big tech billionaires that kind of run and own some of these companies, um, which did kind of, I guess, spook a lot of investors. Um, as to the long-term prospects, go and do your own research on this. But if you are interested in the Asian market, um, obviously still very much developing and growing as an economy, um, yeah, go and have a look at this one. Alrighty, and just to finish up, investing with Superhero. We always do this at the end of our webinars, just to give you a reminder of some of the features on the platform. Um, so you can invest in Aussie and US shares and ETFs as well. Um, it's zero brokerage to buy Australian ETFs. Both of the ETFs mentioned today are listed on the Australian market. So they're an Australian investment, but they hold overseas companies. Um, so just to mention there that an ETF is a way that if you didn't want to buy a US company direct, for example, you could just buy um, an ETF and you wouldn't have to currency transfer or anything, but you would get access, I guess, to the performance of US companies through an investment ETF on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, and there's zero brokerage to buy those, $5 to sell. Um, and then there's $5 on all other Aussie shares and zero brokerage on US shares. Um, you can deposit in real time with pay ID um, and you can transfer between Australian and US dollars in real time as well. There is a currency transfer fee for that, um, but you can do that anytime in your wallet. And that will allow you, if you've deposited Australian dollars, if you want to invest in a US stock, for example, Apple, you go into your wallet, you can transfer to US dollars um, and place that trade there. And that transfer happens in real time. Um, you get access to live market data, We've got portfolio reporting as well, and you can earn Qantas points. We've got a bunch of different Qantas offers on at the moment. If you search superhero.com.au slash Qantas, you'll be able to see an outline of every, every different way that you can earn with Superhero, um, and you can transfer shares as well. Alrighty, I am gonna jump into the Q&A now. Just give me one second and I'll stop sharing my screen. Alrighty. Might not have any in the q and I'll just give it a minute. If anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A function now and I'll get to them in just a moment. And thank you to Hayley. She's popped in the link there to our superhero Qantas offers so you can go and have a look at those. Alrighty, question from Matt there. Matt, feel free if you've got any more superhero specific questions, you can pop into live chat. Um, otherwise, if there's any questions specifically about the webinar content, feel free to pop those in the Q&A. Otherwise, we can finish it up nice and early there. And the recording for this webinar will be on our YouTube channel as well. So if you missed anything or you want to go and have a look in more detail at one of the slides, you'll be able to find it on YouTube. Alrighty. Really apologize, guys, for the for the breaking, breaking up earlier on. Um, just a bit of a an issue with our Wi-Fi there. Alrighty. 
Well, thank you so much for joining the webinar and we hope to see you in one of our webinars in 2023. Thanks everyone.